Okay, so greetings dear students. We're welcome to the lecture one part two. I'm gonna just get right into it. So in this part we're gonna go over the methods of separating mixtures and previously we've talked about what chemistry is we've talked about what matter is and we're going to the different forms and phases of matter and then we talked about mixtures and pure substances and then we went on and on so now we're going to talk about the modes of separating mixtures the modes of separating mixtures so we have first on the list filtration and actually what we do is that once we have a homogeneous solid and liquid mixture we filter the only way to do it is to filter so filtration basically what you have is a, a, a membrane and pores so that it will allow the passage of the liquid and hold back the solid so that's how filtration process works and um, take for example this example of copper sulfate and and sand for instance we know that sand cannot dissolve in water but copper sulfate can so once you put the whole mixture in water copper sulfate will dissolve and then you filter the, the, the solution and then sand will be left on the surface copper sulfate that is the solution of water now will be taken down and then you can go further to do some form of evaporation and then separate that as well so distillation is another method and this resolves homogeneous solid liquid mixtures um, mixture in this case because the previous was heterogeneous because remember heterogeneous when you mix them you can still see the difference they are indifferent but in homogeneous they are uniform so the way to do it is through distillation and in distillation what you just do is you vaporize the liquid and then the solid will remain so we see that you you can have use a mix of methods to separate things and it's just for you to think and logically walk through what can this do that this can't and then you can now make sense of what to do and how to separate things so it's almost like you're trying to solve a puzzle you're trying to solve a puzzle so we go to chromatography and chromatography is uh, another method that is used and the chromatography the meaning from the word chroma colors so in this method you teach research is used basically used for teaching and research in industrial labs and there are different forms of chromatography like paper chromatography and hplc and all of those forms of chromatography and this uses the difference in solubility and the extent of absorption of the solid so it this now capitalizes on the differences in solubility differences in solubility and you can separate many mixtures you can even separate gases mixture of gases and liquid as well with this with this method so you have gas liquid chromatography and you have two different forms of matter interfacing and how you separate those both so you introduce a mixture of volatile gas into the one end and then heat through the tube so this basically you are you are basically you have a mixture and then you use one other to pull the other through in the tube so you have an, a tube that has to be in it because you don't want any interaction with what you're trying to separate so what you're introducing in should not be able to in, to basically interact with the other so you technically will walk through and you have the inner tube and then you pull through the other one so you and what is used is you vaporize with helium and helium is an inert gas Helium is an inert gas, and if, in case you don't know what helium is, helium is that gas that once you take in, it changes the pitch of your voice and they use it to fill balloons so it goes higher as well. So, helium is that gas, so it um, condenses into a viscous liquid. So, what you have is a mode by which you can take out things. And then we talked about distillation previously, so this is a, a distillation apparatus, it's a simple one. So, what you have down here is your Bunsen burner and then this is your round bottom flux and you heat it and then evaporation it, it literally boils you have a thermometer a digital thermometer here and then this is your the column 
So what happens is that cooling water goes out here and comes in here and there's a reason for that. The reason is once the vapor, water vapor goes around this route, the first point of contact is here. So you prefer here to be not as cold as here because if the vapor, if this place is very cold, some of the vapor can quickly escape and it comes down to here that's not as cold. So you, you have some vapor escape, but when here is very cold and here not so as cold, the cooling process is slower. So as it comes down to here, it is more intense and you will not have any water escape. So at the end of the day, it changes state to the liquid and then you have your distilled water at the other end and this is pretty simple distillation apparatus. So we have um, mass spectrometer and gas chromatography. So you have a graph there and you have the spectrometer and on the graph you see peaks and those peaks are indicators of compounds. So that's it for that. And then we go to measurements, go to measurements. And remember we said chemistry is a quantitative course. Is, is you have you deal with quantity and matter is what you're trying to measure in so many sense so so it's a science that's very quantitative and that's why we're talking about matters and measurement matter and measurement so experiments and calculations are involved because for you to measure something you have to do some form of experimenting you have to do some analysis so so you have quantities and they have specific numerical value so so when you're measuring things you have to put some numbers to it we don't count money in words most of the times you do calculations in numbers figures you you can say the money in words but you don't really count them as such so we have a metric system and it's decimal based and the word decimal comes from the word deci which is 10 and if you're counting you will count from if all the figures you have is based on 10 digits which is your 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so it's 0 to 9 after that you keep repeating the same values in twos so the, after 9 you have 10 which is 1 and 0 which is the first two and then you keep going on and on like that so that's the sense in the decimal based stuff so you have units of particular quantity which relate to each other in the power of tens so it's 10 so the same word 10 so it keeps increasing the order after 9 the next round is 10 which is the 10 the 11th and then you have a fresh that's almost like the days of the week after seven days you have eight then it goes back a cycle you have 14 just like that that's how it goes with numbers days is in sevens digits are in tens so and, and this metric this num numbers have like prefixes the word pre is before you fix it before so you fix it before so and those um, prefixes are fixed in front not behind you don't say um, 10 mega you say um you, or I mean, you don't say bytes like bytes for example the digital the bits and bytes bytes kilobytes gigabytes you always put them in front you don't put them behind so they're called prefixes you fix them pre so you have mega which is 10 to the power of 6 you have kilos 10 to the power of 3 and notice the progression in the powers so you have 6 that's mega you have um, 3 which is kilo you have minus 1 which is 30 which is technically your 1 to 10 and then you have minus 2 which is sent in notice the minus don't mistake the 2 there's 10 to the power of 3 and 10 to the power of minus 3 so you have milli which is 10 to the power of negative 3 which is just backwards to 10 to the power of negative 3 and then you have 10 to the power of negative 6 you have 10 to the power negative 9. Negative 6 is micro. The opposite of micro is mega. The opposite of um, your milli is your kilo. So it's like two ways. In the, and the higher values are the 
other ones so you have um the positive ones so you have kilograms of meat milligrams is when it becomes smaller and then you have nano minus nine which is not your nano pod or nano ipod or this nano the measurement system and nano means small very small so you have pico which is minus 12 and there's one that's not there which is minus 10 which is armstrong so you have all of them with their values so with instruments and units you have with instruments and units you have certain um, measurement parameters so one of them is length we'll see length we'll see temperature we'll see weight which is mass so we'll see all of those things so for the standard for length is meter the major length is meter meter so a meter is slightly higher than your yard so you have meter you have yard and now you define them but like distance basically length distance and you have orders which is your centimeter you can measure someone's height in centimeter you have and which is 10 to the, one centimeter is 10 to the power minus two remember from the previous centi minus two and centi is more hundred related it's like inch but this is backwards so you have 10 one centimeter is 10 to the power minus two meter and then one millimeter 10 to the power minus three notice that the symbols when they go out you put the power when the symbols go out you put the power so you see c is 10 to the power minus 2 so you put 10 to the power minus 2 and put your m millimeter is 10 to the power minus 3 so you put that and put your m so kilometer is 10 to the power 3 you put your m so that's basically what happens don't confuse it because what can happen sometimes is that you think it's the other way around so you can write one meter and put is equal to 10 to the power of minus two centimeter don't do that <laughs> really actually don't do that sometimes people can mistake and get confused just look at the symbol look at the symbol and know what the power is so you have um expressions of the cubic centimeter now you're going to volume because length is just one dimension or one plane but volume is three dimensions because once you're taking volume you're taking length times breadth times height so that's why you have to the power of three that's why you have things like 3d your l your y and z something like this i don't know how you do something like this something like this so you have this dimension this dimension and this dimension so you have cubic meters and actually centimeter cube is um a typical example is your bottle of water the you remember we said water doesn't have volume it has a volume a fixed volume but the shape is not fixed it's indefinite so a bottle of water is your 0 0.5 a small bottle of water is your 0 0.5 liter and that can be converted to your 500 centimeter cube 500 centimeter cube or 500 milliliter so that's the conversion we'll see we'll see it as we progress that one milliliter is equal to one centimeter cube one milliliter one centimeter cube so we'll see that in this so notice that one centimeter cube is equal to remember when we take away c we'll say 10 to the power minus two and then meter then you it totals up because with powers you multiply them because you have negative and in fact the back rate is indicative of a multiplication so you multiply them you have minus six and then you also multiply the symbol so m is to the power of three as well and then when you go down you have your one liter which is equal to 10 to the power of three uh, minus three sorry and then you have millimeter cube as well so it's 10 to the power of three centimeter cube so notice that one milliliter is equal to 10 to the power of minus three liter because of the m there and then it's 10 to the power of minus six so notice that both centimeter cube and and um, milliliter are very equal and the same you see that from here because all of them resolves in the same answer 
so it implies that one milliliter is equals to one centimeter cube and i said it when i started that your 0 0.5 liter is the same as 500 milliliter and is the same as 500 centimeter cube so that's how you can remember this so common there are common there are common devices that you use to make measurements and one of them is the graduated cylinder i will see the picture in front i used to joke i said the this graduated cylinder is the only thing that has not actually graduated but is graduated and the graduation simply means the markings on it it doesn't mean that he graduated from the university so the pipette and bered are under, also on other devices and they are used for greater accuracy so it means that they are the margin the error margin is smaller so this is your pipette and this is your burret so this is your pipette here and this is your burret they are basically titration instruments that you basically things you use for titration and we'll see this cylinder ahead so now we go to mass notice that we did length we did volume and we are doing mass so with mass now you're doing grams you're doing grams so one gram is equal to 10 to the power of minus three kilogram notice that you put the kilo there so that you can walk your way backwards to gram because kilo is 10 to the power of three so if you do 10 to the power of three and 10 to the power minus three you go back to one so that's at the back so you have kilograms and you have milligrams talked about it and then you have metric tons now you're talking about mega grams so mass and weight there's a difference between mass and weight and difference is slight so mass is a measurement of an amount of matter in the object amount of matter remember matter is anything that has weight and occupy space it has mass sorry and occupy space and then weight is the gravitational force that acts on an object let's remind ourselves that on this earth we have gravity that acts on us so you have gravity that acts on us which is 10 point just 10 10 um, um, yeah gravity acts on us also 10 g or so yeah so you have gravity acting on us and basically when you climb on the scale to weigh yourself it's not just your weight there's also gravity acting on you as well and the way you can make sense of it is this whole idea of um, when you have a stone and you have a feather and then when you drop them because the stone weighs more it goes down the ground quickly and the feather weighs less so it takes its time but with zero gravity you have both of them land at the same time so it means that there's an action of gravity on both of them so weight actually is gravitational force acting on the object while the mass is the actual measurement of the matter so weight plus gravity mass the main thing the main matter itself so um, we have um, um, a, a measuring a weighing balance a weighing balance and you have you use that to weigh mass and some of the weighing balance comes with a hood to avoid the action of gravity but this is your weighing balance and it's called your weighing balance because you get the weight from it and if you want to now take the mass of it you have to use the hood that that limits the action of gravity on the samples that you're weighing and you have to tie it to zero and notice that on the screen there you have 144.998 grams 144.998 grams and that's your, your 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 weight of whatever it is that is on the weighing balance so now we move to temperature <coughs> so the so temperature now is different we've done length volume mass now temperature and very soon you're gonna have changes in fact we're already experiencing changes in temperature at the point in time that you're watching this video we're not wearing jackets so temperature is very important and it needs to be measured and in fact with the whole if you're watching this around the time of the pandemic as well you you realize that 
basically people do temperature checks up and down to verify and to ensure to certify that you are corona free which is not 100 percent, but it works so the factor that determines the direction of heat flow is temperature and when there's a contact between two objects there's different temperatures that the difference in temperature because the idea is that the weather is cold when you're in contact with the cold weather you there's a transfer because heat moves it is transferable so it's like particles are set in motion and then there's a movement of that heat so heat flows from an object of high temperature to the one of lower it's almost like diffusion and osmosis so there's a movement because the pot is very hot you touch it sends a little bit of it to you it's like electricity as well this movement once there's an electric current through a cable if you touch it there's going to be a flow in the sense so the units for it are celsius fahrenheit and kelvin and celsius and fahrenheit have degrees and kelvin doesn't have a degree so it's almost like when i talked about graduated cylinder this is slightly different they have the first two have degrees kelvin doesn't have the degree so i used to joke i used to say kelvin is the only one that didn't go to university so he doesn't have a degree but celsius and fahrenheit both of them have degrees so celsius is the first on the list and you water actually freezes at zero degrees and water boils at 100 degrees so the margin is 100 fahrenheit actually freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit um, and boils at 212 and comparing the two of them you discover that 0 degrees Celsius is 32 degrees Fahrenheit notice that the difference is just the units and 100 degrees Celsius is 212 degrees Fahrenheit so actually if you look at them very closely you discover that between 100 and 212 is 112 and between 0 and 32 is actually 32 so if you minus them you have that so there's 180 degrees Fahrenheit for 100 degrees Celsius so it's 180 degrees for 100 degrees so we can see that it's 1.8 greater than Fahrenheit so the how we work these things is that in when you add both um, Fahrenheit and Celsius you have um, 242 242 yep, 242 when you add that and this is 100 so this is that the, the margin between them or you minus no you minus 32 from one yeah 32 from 120 yeah yeah when you minus 32 from 212 you have 180 you have 180 and that 180 is basically your scale difference because you have 0 to 100 and then you have the difference between that as 180 so it means that once you divide um 180 by 100 you have 1.8 which is the conversion factor between the two of them and that's why we basically will multiply the conversion I will, I will i'll explain that when we're doing a calculation and i will i will give you an example to do ahead so notice that to confirm what we said earlier you have boiling water and the boiling water is 100 degrees celsius and 212 degrees fahrenheit and the frozen water at the side which is this one is zero degrees and zero degrees Celsius and 32 degrees Fahrenheit so with the Kelvin scale we we'll just look at the Kelvin scale and then look at the conversions very quickly but remember that 1.8 is a conversion factor and it's gotten from the differences between Celsius and Fahrenheit so for fa for Kelvin we said it's not it's the only one that doesn't have a degree so it's 1 over 273.16 and that's the difference between the lowest attainable temperature and triple that of it triples that of the degree Celsius which is 0 
So unlike the other two, it doesn't have a degree and the sign is expressed with just K. So it's just on the basis of the comparison. So it doesn't necessarily have a degree of sort. So now for for you to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius, of which this thing can go forward and backwards, depends on what you're looking for. So you have a degree Fahrenheit, which is equal to 1.8 degrees Celsius, whatever temperature you have. So you multiply that too, and then you add 32 degrees to it. And that's how you get Fahrenheit. And to do otherwise, you have to reverse it, meaning that if you had Fahrenheit, you would just take 32 to the other side and it will be minus 32 and then you divide by 1.8 so it's just simply simple conversion and then with kelvin you will just add 2731 3.15 to the celsius so notice that degree celsius is what you need to play through both so if you have degree celsius you can find fahrenheit if you have degree celsius you can find kelvin so and if you want to find Kelvin and you have only Fahrenheit, you have to find Celsius to find Kelvin. So it's the way between every one of them. So we have an example and I'd like you to pause your video right now and try to solve this one. So you're going to first solve for Kelvin and solve for Fahrenheit, sorry, and then you solve for Kelvin. So pause your video and do that. I'm actually watching you you have not posted your video so just post your video and do it and then we'll go right into it so post your video now i'm telling you for the second time i want to do it again for the third time so i'm guessing that you post the video and you did it and if you did so the question is the mercury thermometer as a typical mercury thermometer the old now we have different thermometers we have the digital one that you use but a typical mercury thermometer you put underneath your armpit to take your temperature has been phased out because of the toxicity of the mercury vapor so a common replacement is this organic liquid called the isometal benzoid and it boils at 262 degrees celsius so they say what is the boiling point in degrees fahrenheit and kelvin so that's the question and we're going to look how you solve it through and it's, the value is 262 so first and foremost we asked for Kelvin and we ask for Fahrenheit. So given the formulas, basically we just multiply 262 by 1.8 and add 32 degrees to it and then we get our value. Then for the next one, we just basically we just add 273.15 to the other. So it's just straightforward. It's not a difficult thing. So if you did that, this is the answers you're going to get. And please, the reason why I want you to be posting the videos and be doing the exercises, at least try and engage yourself. Because if you don't engage yourself, you basically not have an idea as to what exactly is going on. And it's very important that you do so and engage and get the most of it. Make it as life as possible. Because I can't, you can't get the feedback from. I can't get the feedback from you. But if you pause the video and it gets more interactive, so we. I'll just do this quickly and then we'll probably find a place to pause. So this, there's what we call uncertainty is a measurement. Once you're doing measurements, you get to a point where your the values might not exactly be you there's some certain margin of errors that might arise when you're taking measurement because of um, accuracy in in, in people deduction or maybe the measuring devices that you use so we we'll look that's basically what this is going to be focused on on uh, how you tell your values or your data so it's what we call significant figures and it's a mode of citing the degree of confidence in a measurement so when we say degree of confidence is how sure you are of that particular measurement or that particular um, value you got from that thing so every measurement carries some form of uncertainty if i told you that i had about maybe i have about two thousand dollars layer on my account i didn't say i have two thousand dollars i say i have about so it's not necessarily a fixed value that you can hold on to you might go to the bank and discover it's eighteen thousand or you might go to the bank and discover it's twenty one thousand so it's so there's some degree of uncertainty in about so if you say is even this value there's a possibility that it might be plus or minus one short so measurements must include 
some estimates of uncertainty in them so we don't know how far away from the 2000 tier or 20,000 tier that that is available so but if we give a margin we say maybe like 19,000 to 21,000 so the person now is more aware of what is most likely to expect so there's more like a degree of confidence that's kind of like the degree of confidence what is meant by degree of confidence so there is an uncertainty of at least one unit in the last digit so maybe at least that's one maybe plus or minus one unit so there's a certain thing in measuring volume and we'll see this with the graduated cylinder situation we talked about and they have different sizes so that's why they have different sizes as well so the volume measurement in the uncertainty so you have the large graduated cylinder which is eight in that eight value and plus and we'll see the image here yeah there's a big one and the small one and notice that the the big one on this other side is is in your um i think that's 10 15 okay the one the small one notice that is in this you have seven eight nine so you have it in like one one unit and notice the spaces between them so it's like one two three four like one two three four one one two three four and then the fifth one so it means that every bar there is 0 0.2 so it's 0 0.2 0 0.4 0 0.6 0 0.8 then one in that order so notice that the uncertainty is on the 0 0.1 scale and then you have this other one here where every bar is like one so it's like one two three four the five the fifth one is the longer one and then you get to the next one 20 so it goes on like that so notice that for the large one the plus or minus is one milliliter because of the the, the, the what you have the calibrations on it is spaced in one milliliter and then for the smaller one is 0 0.1 so that i told you 0 0.1 0 0.2 but 0 point something is the scaling and then you have the burette which is 0 0.01 and those ones as we said earlier are for more accuracy you have more accuracy with that so the text conversion is of for uncertainty is plus or minus plus or minus that this symbol here is what you use for uncertainty it's almost like your margin of error and the last digit is what is in that can be stated so basically what we saw from there so now we have another example i think when we do this example we'll end but we end up we end up we end that day we'll put we'll come to the end with this example so just pause the video and try to ensure that you go for it from there just pause the video and let's see how it goes you just stop with this just pause and then go right into it so just pause and try to answer the question pause and try to answer the question and then we'll see how So if you've tried to attempt that, let's see. If you try to attempt it, so we'll just go for it. So this one, I said that a student using the weighing balance that we saw previously, different students had different measuring they, they measured at them different times and then their measurement winded up as such where they they reported the following masses uh, on the basis of that you have the first one as 1.611 grams the second one as 1.60 gram and then the last one as 0 0.01611 kilograms notice the difference in units so they say how many significant figure does each value have how many significant figures does each value have? So the strategy here is to analyze and then look at the last number and all of those things for the measurement. So let's go into it quickly. So notice that the first one is four significant figure. One is a value, six is a value, one is a value, one under one is a value, so that's four. Then the next one is 1.06. So it means every of the value is a value. 
every of the value you have there is of value plus zero as well is of value to the nearest one and then the last one is four notice that if you were to make it grams it's going to be the same as the first one so every one of them are very much of values very much about the significant figure not the zeros in front but rather this value so it's the same so it's basically the same as this so and when you use notations it's the same you will discover that it's the same thing true when you use the notations the notations where you have the exponential notations where you have um, 1.611 times 10 to the power of zero it's the same 1.60 times 10 to the power of zero it's kind of very similar the only difference is just the values once at the end and this one you you see it obviously 1.611 is the same as this the only difference is just this which is which the kilogram basically makes up for and then that's it for that so i think we'll continue next with the ambiguity of we'll continue next in the next video with the ambiguity of significant figures i think that's we'll just stop here for now and then we'll continue so i look forward to seeing you in the next part so this is part two and we'll see i'll see you in part three so i'll just see you guys later